Hey, good afternoon, morning, evening, where you ever may be to everyone. You know, thanks for joining. It's uh, it's one o'clock. We've got a lot to to speak about, and um, I always uh, like to start meetings, um, webinars on time, um, because I think. Um, Uh, I think starting meetings late uh, actually penalizes those who show up on time. So, so welcome to uh, the PCI Dream Team, uh, getting the answers you need about PCI version four. Um, just a quick disclaimer, um, the opinions expressed on this webinar is, um, are those of myself and my uh, three esteemed colleagues. Uh, we're not speaking on behalf of employers. And we're certainly not uh, um, speaking on behalf of the PCI Security Standards Council, everything is uh, from our own. Um, so this is the uh, official uh, legal disclaimer uh, about us. So uh, my name is Ben Rothke, Senior Information Security Manager with TAPAD. I uh, was in the, the QSA space uh, for a while. I'm no longer a QSA. I did uh, some writing that I'll share with you in a moment with uh, Dave Munhake. So uh, why don't we give a... Um, you know, each of you gentlemen, Coop, Jeff, and Dave, a uh, 30-second uh, intro to who you are and what you're all about. So. I think your spell check messed up up there because I'm with Trusted Sec. I don't know what True Secure is, but... Oh, uh, you're right. Okay. Yeah, see, this is this is another feeble attempt by Ben to to discredit me. No, just kidding. <laughs> but uh, a lot you of are, folks... You are... You are a QSA, though, are you not? I am a QSA. Um, as okay. In fact, I was in uh, as, uh, in this, uh, the very early classes for QSA and PA QSA, and and uh, been doing this for a long time. A lot of folks know me uh, as Coop, um, and uh, looking forward to another uh, interesting and always fun session with my colleagues. I'm Jeff Hall. Everyone knows me as the PCI Guru. Um, I am a principal security consultant with Truvantis, but oh, that's I'm right. Also... I'm a principal too. Boy, I tell yeah. you, Ben, we're gonna. <laughs> but you know, okay. I like Coop. I I I've been a QSA forever. Before that, I was a QDSP. There were a few of us. I know that's where Coop and I originally met. Was out in Foster City. Um, long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, and, and before that, I was doing work for Visa, doing their CISP assessments in 2002 and on. So, David? You bet. So my name is David Mundhank. I'm a principal security consultant with uh, Herjavec Group. I'm in my sixth year with uh, Herjavec Group. Uh, specialize in GRC and PCI as well as a little um, OT stuff these days. Before that, I worked at Coal Fire for three years and where I was on their application validation team. I did a lot of PADSS work. And before that, I was at IBM for seven years where I led a PAQSA practice. Uh, we thank, I'd like to thank personally the, the Secure Trust team for having us again, um, having ha inviting us back and um, the, I think we've been anticipating this session for quite a long time, so there's going to be a lot of fun and a lot of hopefully good banter um, and and good conversations around this topic. Yeah, it's trusted sec, and I think it's so funny. We, <laughs> oh, sorry, we trusted. Keep messing up. Yeah, we keep messing up all the names, but you notice they, oh. they almost always contain true, trust, and secure. Okay. Now everybody watching us is probably thinking, is any of this true? Is it trustworthy? And how secure is this webinar? <laughs> Right. So here's, um, you know, for everyone here is, uh, you know, just some things, you know, we've written about uh, anything around PCI, the first place you want to go to is the PCI website. Uh, the second place you want to go to is, is Jeff's, uh, Jeff's blog. And uh, here's some uh, other things, uh, uh, you know, we've written about both individually and um, as a team. So with the, uh, you know, with that, you know, our agenda today is, uh, discuss uh, you know PCI version four. Uh, if you, any questions, you know, enter them in the uh, in the chat window. You could uh, on Twitter um, or send it to um, um, send it to uh, this uh, our, our Gmail account. Um, and as you can see from this um, this uh, version four uh, was um, you know four years uh, in the making uh, between uh, three two one and 
um, 4.0, which came out uh, you know earlier this month. It is a uh, highly significant change. There's a lot there. There's a lot to uh, to digest in you know 350 plus pages of of um, of the standard of the DSS. Um, anyone who says they're a uh, um, uh, you know uh, a, a version four guru, you know they're uh, <laughs> not being completely honest there because there's there's so much there, and even though it's it's quite descriptive, um, you know there's a lot of gray area there also. So you know everyone's in the same boat. You're just trying to you know make sense of this. No one has had uh, you know QSA training in version four yet. Um, so this is really a, a, a large part a a work in progress. Um, as I say, you know, Jeff, if you want to, you know, you know, get the ball rolling, uh, you know, from your end, you know, your, your insights, your thoughts, um, you spent a lot of time, you know, digging through this. So, um, are we at the slides there, Ben? Yeah, I can go. My, uh, my, my slides there. Yeah, here it is. So let's, let's skip ahead a little bit to the, um, where the requirement was. We'll start with that. So right there. Yeah. So the first thing that really got me going <laughs> is not only do you have to check a box now, so in place, in place with remediation, which is an interesting concept, um, not applicable, not tested, not in place, so let's let's talk a couple of those boxes. Not tested now. The council's gone back on their original advice, which was in the past, any rock that had a not not tested checkbox could not have an AOC. Now we can have an AOC, um, which is an interesting interesting thing for those of us that argued and when it first came out and said, well, if you can't have an AOC, what's the point? <laughs> um, the new one is in place with remediation, which I know is probably going to cause heartburn for QSAs because now you're going to have to inquire was there a problem at some point since the last assessment that you had to fix things? That's what in place with remediation means. But the, the second piece of the heartburn is that describe why you check that box. And it's gonna be interesting to see what they tell us in training as to how descriptive you have to be there. Um, because if you check in place, as far as I'm concerned, you better be able to just say not applicable on that silly box. Um, the others, I get why you'd want to have a description there. Um, but for in place, if you're checking in place, I, I don't know why you'd have to justify it. If you want to bump ahead one slide because following this is the next piece of this, which is whether or not you're using a customized approach, yes or no. And yes, if you, you are doing that, you have to name what customized approach you're, you're using because you can have multiples of them and they do get named. Um, and then whether or not you have a compensating control used. So if you did a custom, one question I've had is, can you have both a customized approach and a CCW? I'm guessing you might be able to, and that, that brings up another point. With the customized approach, the biggest thing I see is, is they're changing password length from seven to 12 characters. That's a future dated requirement supposed to go into effect March, the end of March 2025. So you're going to have companies that have mainframes, AS400s, other systems that can only accept an eight character password. And that is allowed under the, under the, uh, under the requirements. But 
if you have a customized approach and you have a system that needs a CCW, can you have both of them? And and because they've never indicated it, and it's it's really not clear in any of the documentation if that's allowed or if they're mutually exclusive. Um, so that's that's going to be an interesting question that we're all going to have when we go into training as to whether or not those exist. Yeah, I think it's very interesting because uh, even the wording there where it says uh, customized approach and then it says defined approach. So I'm sitting there going, um, okay, you know, um, as much as I like the idea of the customized approach, the, the problem for me, and this is just my personal problem, as you know, I was a trainer uh, for a while at the PCI SSC. And one of the most important things that we used to teach about compensating controls is there had to be either a technical constraint or a business constraint. And so for me, if we're gonna call that a defined approach, then I'm assuming we're still gonna follow the same idea that there is either a business or a technical constraint. And I guess at, at that point, if there's a business or a technical constraint, how do I then put together a customized approach? So I really can't wait for the training <laughs> because well, and, and that, that's, <laughs> that's something I wanna know. <laughs> well, the customized approach is for those people that want to adopt, for example, the biggest example we have is the NIST password controls. Right, exactly. And and I know we're going to see a lot of people that are going to want to do that because you can get out of changing your password every, you know, every 12 months or whatever. Um, which let's let's move ahead here, Ben, to since we've opened the can of worms on the uh, let's flip ahead. We'll keep okay. going ahead. I want to get yeah. to the customized approach. So, yeah, yeah just like Jeff, like I think one thing you know, we should just you know, let people know is that there is a um, significant uh, transition period to 4.0. So, um, I mean, 3.1 is not going to be retired fully for another two years. So it's not like people have, you know, 90 days to become, you know, 4.0 compliance. Well, like, we're even without yeah, the new requirements. You know. We just, we just went under the three year mark. So, because mm -hmm. everything, although there are two requirements out there that don't have dates, um, which is another thing I've got questions about, but because um, they keep pointing you to a non-existent section within the rock. <laughs> So there's no guidance there. I think one of them is three, two, one, and the other one is three, six, two, one. They're both in section three. They're they're on bullet items, and there's there's just nothing there. So the customized approach is what they're offering to give you flexibility. And so I believe there's three slides here, Ben. So here's the first yeah. slide. Part of it, it's up to the assessee to fill out. So all this stuff has to be filled out by the assessee. And then there's one more, Ben, which is, uh, I guess not. Go back. There's there's one. No, no. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Too far. So this has, whoop, nope. Go back to the customized approach. One yeah. more forward. Okay. So this gets filled out, and then the last piece here is the testing that the assessor has to do. So not only does the assessor test, but the entity being audited or assessed has to test it, and they have to say. So this isn't some compensating control worksheet anymore. This is, this is real on got to put some rubber to the road type thing because this isn't this isn't going to fly so keep going forward ben to the next slide so 
Here, here's another little gem that has to be done as well. Not only do you have to do your own development of it and your own testing of it, and then the assessor has to test it, but you have to develop a customized approach controls matrix that explains how it addresses the various requirements that you're trying to address with your customized approach. And so with the passwords, you're probably going to have all those password control requirements listed in here. And then you have to fill out this little lower section here for every one of those requirements and address every one of those questions. So again, not simple. Go, go to the next slide, Ben. But better yet, if that wasn't enough paperwork for you to do, you now have to perform a targeted risk analysis on what you're taking a customized approach on to justify that you're not creating a bigger risk than what the requirements that you were supposed to be following. And so again, you're gonna to have to put, provide this to your QSA as well. So I love, I love uh, 1.3 there, the wording. Describe the mischief that the requirement yeah. the percent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's a, that's a very British term, also. <laughs> yeah. So, um, as it relates to this customized approach, and and I may get this wrong because I'm still trying to learn this, but it appears to me that the dynamic is going to be that the client or customer, if they're going to use this for any given requirement, they essentially have to uh, do their own risk assessment and document. The, the risk assessment and, and actually validate that whatever they're coming up with as a combination of controls is going to actually provide equal to or better than protection than the regular requirement. So from my perspective, that's going to mean that it looks like the QSA and the QSA firm is going to be on the hook to be the final arbiter of whether or not the, the, the evidences, the documentation is correct and whether it's legitimate and defendable. What's your take on that, guys? Well, I, I mean, and it's not just the customized approach, Dave. If you go through and read through the new version, there are all sorts of risk, these targeted risk analyses that the company has to go through just as part of their day-to-day -day PCI whatever. So, I mean, we're picking on it here for because it's part of the customized approach process, which is what every, I, I kind of laughed, you know, there were all those tweet feeds going out from the council. Oh, this is great. There's so much flexibility, blah, 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 blah you know, pushing the flexibility. Oh yeah, there's tons of flexibility but there's also tons of paperwork if you want that flexibility. And so, yes, I, I mean, I, I like it too. People are going to have flexibility, but it comes at a price. There's no free lunch here. No, I, I agree with you, but, but I'm still, so I agree with you, but I'm still holding back a little bit because um, now all of us here, the four of us, I know you remember when a certain gentleman that I worked with over at Trustwave, when it was Trustwave, came to the PCI Council and developed those criteria that we had on a spreadsheet as QSAs. And it said, document what did you see, what was the, the configuration file, what the, the, and then the AQM team at the council held us to that. And so they were coming into the QSA companies and saying your reports are not showing, you know, mm -hmm. so for each requirement, you remember we had that whole big matrix. We, and everything. we all went into remediation. We all went into remediation, <laughs> exactly. And so this is the point I'm bringing up now. Um, me, me thinks um, this could be another 
possible thing that happens. And I don't think it, 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 it is uh, uh, a bad thing. And I don't think it reflects uh, poorly on the council or anything like that, I, or, or the QSAs. I think um, the thing that, so here's what I've been telling my clients with the timeline, Basically, if you're involved in completing your rock for this year, or even your SAC or what have you, uh, for this year, you're going to be able to use uh, the existing version 321 for this year and also in 2023. And then it will be the year after in 2024 when you absolutely will be using uh, 4.0. And so I've, I've been telling my clients, let's, let's not panic um, and let's see what type of information um, we, the QSAs, we are going to get when we go through the training and then maybe see if this is going to end up uh, another one where you went out to the council website and everybody was read in remediation for a while. <laughs> so that's kind of my take of it. Like I said, I, I you know me, I always try to play devil's well, advocate I mean, for and, both sides. And, and <laughs> we're, all, we're all talking about this before we've been to the version four training. So we've got all these forms and all this stuff and we haven't been provided any guidance yet as to how it's all supposed to work. And so we're trying to we're trying to make sense of it because you know it's it's our job to try and make sense of it. At at the end of the day, I will stand by my statement in my blog from I think it was a year ago. Maybe not, maybe just eight months ago. But at the end of the day, if you're a merchant and you're holding on to cardholder data, you have two years to get rid of it. Because you, if this is what you face going forward, you, you, it will kill you. It will physically kill you. It will kill you. It will kill your business. <laughs> because you're not going to tolerate going through this proctological exam. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> well, but, but, <laughs> I, I, I mean, if if you thought three, two, one was bad, <laughs> oh my God, this is this is this is a colonoscopy, people. That's so funny. <laughs> well, I never, I never really thought three, two, one was that bad, and I know, you know, having because I actually wrote rocks under one point oh all the way up through. Oh yeah, as we all did, and so. I personally felt that 321 to me was like Windows NT 6 service pack. <laughs> uh, what was that last service pack? 3A Four. or something. Or yeah, what it, you know, when, when NT4 service pack 6 or something was 6A or whatever the hell it was when, okay, Windows finally has all this crap working. Now let's throw it out and do Win2K and everything else. And that's kind of where I've been with, with version 321. Um, but I see what you're saying. I, we, we, we've had someone post a question and I think it's valid. Um, and I answered it offline, but I wanna say quickly, they were asking is the new P2P SAC any difficult, whatever. We don't have the SACs yet. We only have the rock template. We don't have any SAC templates for 4 yet that I'm aware of. And if we do, then that's news to no. me. But, so we don't know those yet. And the other thing uh, that I saw posted out here by somebody and I wanna bring it up because I think it's a great point. Um, this particular individual says that the problem with this is that there's going to be a lot of overhead involved with this. And the fear that this individual has is you might have some QSAs that don't have enough technical understanding to really know what's going on and are going to just bless it. Um, and I would say that's a very, a very a possible issue. Um, and you know, as a seasoned, I don't call myself an old fart anymore, as a seasoned <laughs> professional, this is all, <laughs> Jeff's laughing because he knew, we're, we're all in this together. I mean, it's a common uh, thing that I worry about all the time, and I don't think it's just based on age, but just the fact that all of us have had so much experience with PCA, we really do worry about this, and I think it's going to be something that's going to go through a cycle where there's going to be a lot of 
a QSA. It's not necessarily just the younger folks, but you know, there's going to be other QSAs that are our age, and they're going to say, okay, that's good. Um, and it and it isn't good. And so is that a possibility? Uh, is that an issue like this individual has brought up? Yes, it is. I think it is an issue. A well, I'm, glad issue. You, I'm glad you brought that up because we at Herzvec Group have already started our internal discussions about how important it is. It's always been important, but how important it is to have consensus and um, you know ubiquity across your entire QSA team. You know, um, you can't have one QSA go into an environment from a, from a QSA firm and a year later somebody else goes in and they see something different. Or um, we kind of encounter this all the time, you know, um, or we may have a client that's very savvy. It really knows this stuff inside and out. And then we have clients that, <laughs> know that think they know it inside and out. So um, if, if the QSA firm and team is going to be the final arbiter of that, then it's very important that everybody is on the same page, interprets the stuff the same way, and can provide a, you know, an organizational consensus when it comes to what we all know is going to happen is these, these very spirited and passionate discussions about, you know, whether this, you know, customized approach is, it provides sufficient control, um, to provide equal to or better than protection than the original requirement. So that's, put, that's going to put a little burden on QSA firms, but at the end of the day, we should be doing that anyway. But it also, I agree with, with the person who brought that up, Coop, is, you know, it's going to put a lot of burden on organizations, who are not, you know, especially small to medium-sized businesses who just don't have the resources or the time or the, the, the wherewithal or the knowledge to, to be able to sort through all of this. So uh, one point I'd also like to add is that, um, if, and clarify for those who are on this call, you know, it, uh, QSA firms cannot actually do 4.0 assessments until they've gone through sufficient training. And yeah. it's gonna be mandated training. I'm not sure if there's gonna be an exam or not, but we, we as a QSA firm- Supposedly and, there is, David, that was yeah. on the last assessor call yeah. is- There will be. There will be an exam. The training is supposed to go on, somebody had asked, the training is supposed to happen in June, supposedly. Yeah, they got to get rid of those little pictures. You know, those little guys that are on the slides? I put those in when I worked for the council, and I love <laughs> seeing them. Um, because if you think about it, those requirements and those slides that, you know, those little pictures of the little white guy with the ruler, the little white Gumby characters and all that stuff, um, it always makes me laugh every year when I do my uh, exam and, and go through the slides for the, the training because it's all this stuff I had put together. So, you know, believe it or not, I'm actually really looking forward uh, to the 4.0 training and oh, I'm well. really looking forward to um, Well, that's just because you didn't write it. Yeah. That, 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 that's right. <laughs> well, I know Gareth and the fellas and the ladies. Are, I know. Uh, they've updated and, you know, but, but I mean, certainly the, the thing that makes me laugh are the little pictures and the, uh, the, the scenario from Crazy Chicken. That was one of my oh, favorite years. Oh, yeah, that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I found the chicken picture with him sitting in the bowl. So, and, and it this makes me the, laugh. Um, but, but I think... Training. You're breaking up. Yeah, you're breaking up. training to start in, uh, in June. Right. That's what I had heard is June. Yeah. And, and, I, and we're all going to have to take it. And we're all going to have to be uh, pass the examination. And, sure. and, I, and I think it's a good thing. But boy, David, you're right. One of the things that we do here at Trusted Sec is all of us that are on the PCI team, uh, we get together. Anytime something comes up with any client of any QSA where there's like a stance that we have to take as a company, we discuss it and we have a, an area where we maintain all of those quote stances oh, nice. uh, so that, you know, so that we do that. And, and I think with this new version, this is going to become uh, even more so important that we be very consistent with this. Well, in, oh, addition, yeah. in addition to that, you know, it's great that we as QSAs and QSA firms are going to get that training, but I think it's incumbent and important uh, for us, as well as hopefully the PCI Council and the card brands to try to train and provide knowledge share to their merchants and service providers, because this stuff was mind bending before 4 you know, now it's, you know, every time, and, and it's interesting, every time I read through the 4 standard, I find something I missed before. 
And you guys, we, you know, we've been talking about this for a while now. When you read through it, and Jeff, you've been great about this, you'll find stuff and, and share it with us. And I miss completely miss that. So I, I, I really feel for the merchant and service provider community. So, you know, I think it's going to be even more important for this team, as well as all of the other stakeholders in what they call the uh, card payment card processing ecosystem to, to educate the merchants and service providers so we can all, you know, come to the table and, and discuss this in a rational, reasonable fashion. And, you know, if flexibility is justified, we want to support that. But you know, at the end of the day, I thought, you know, compensating control, passionate spirited discussions with clients <laughs> was fun. This is going to be yeah. the whole oh. level. Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, you know, version four is definitely, you know, putting, you know, upping the ante and even, you know, the compensated control worksheet was a relatively straightforward now with, uh, as Jeff was describing, you know, that that targeted risk analysis is uh, is a beast and it takes a significant input, you know, to get the data to do that. And one other point earlier um, um, we we're talking about is, you know, 4.0 is adding so much companies are going to be relying on their QSAs, you know, for a lot more, and that could get expensive very quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, you know, one of those uh, things that companies haven't looked at is, is the ISA program, um, the internal, internal security assessor, and, you know, send your people to that training, and they really, an ISA is no different from a QSA, except they could just do one firm, and I think the more companies invest in their own people, it's, um, it's a win-win situation because you've got that internal uh, expertise, that internal training, and they're going to be a, a fraction of the cost of a, of a QSA. Absolutely. I, it's two of my clients that are very large and very complicated uh, card data environments. Thank God I have an ISA uh, yeah. inside. Both of those clients have, have sent uh, one or more of their people to become ISAs. And so that's something yeah. that I think uh, my personal opinion is we need more uh, merchants and service providers to do that. And not just for 4.0, yeah. just, just do it now and get them in, in there and get them trained uh, as soon as they're able to give them the, the 4.0 training right along with the QSAs. Um, it, it's going to be very right. difficult. And I think that the, the, the ambiguity that comes out every time we make major hurdles like this uh, in the uh, ecosystem, the PCI ecosystem, I guess is what Dave said. I like that term. Um, you know, there's always going to be ambiguity. The QSAs have to get trained, and then we have to sort of make sure we're mustering correctly and giving the right information to the merchants and service providers. And if and and if you follow what Jeff has said, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. Um, if you're storing card data and you think you're going to get through this easily, you're nuts. Uh, unless you are somebody issuing cards or have this devout need to have a bunch of card data around, get rid of it. And so really, I think there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to change. And this could drive costs considerably. Well, oh, I'm glad you brought up the term ambiguity. So we have a question from Mr. Larry Rosen who um, used that term as well. And, he's, and his question is, do you think all of this is going to drive the cost of PC compliance up? And unfortunately, it, I think that's highly probable. Mm -hmm. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I think there's no, there's no question there. I mean, you're adding a lot more uh, requirements. With those requirements come complexity. Um, and those things don't come for free. I mean, uh, uh, I mean in general, you know, costs are going up. But yeah, it's, um, well, I, you know, you just leverage. Um, there's a lot of ways to, do that, you know, leverage the ISA and also, you know, try to get, you know, lessen your CDE. That's the best way to save money. That's right. Reduce the scope of that CDE. It's going to be, uh, it's always been important. And while segmentation and uh, scope reduction has never been a requirement, um, uh, it, it's it's going to almost uh, be ridiculous if, if you're a merchant and you're taking a card present payment cards and you don't have an end-to-end -end or a point-to-point -point scheme in place, then you better get one. <laughs> I've been preaching that for years, and now I'm sort oh. of saying that you better. <laughs> we, we all have. 
So, David, there's a question out there that I'm going to feed to you on the new requirements for e-commerce that are all wow. future dated. Because I know, I know you thought those were priceless. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, it, um, I think you guys on the team and some of the folks on the call know I've been evangelizing uh, client-side web browser security uh, for quite some time now, and I've actually put the question to the council, put the question to the card brand. So far, until now, there has been really no response, but at the end of the day, and I actually pulled this up because I thought I might get this question, if I can find it here. So 6.4.3, all payment page scripts that are loaded and executed in the consumer's browser, browser are managed as follows. A method is implemented to confirm that each script is authorized. A method is implemented to assure the integrity of each script. An inventory of all script is maintained with written justification as to why each is necessary. Uh, as I've alluded to before, um, client side uh, security testing and validation has basically not been part of the penetration testing and offensive uh, te testing toolkit because of all the various uh, ver uh, ver variations in browsers and their configurations. Uh, in addition to that, nowadays, you can log into a, an e-commerce site or any website, and depending on how much business intelligence that they gather on you from the scripts that they're loading on your client side, you may get a different page every time you log in, and, and they're dynamically assigned to you. So I've been preaching for a long time. This is just my opinion. Um, but that, that, that I actually refer to the client-side web browser as the Mariana Trench of attack surfaces because very little visibility has been a, a, a available to get to see what's going on there. There are technologies out there that can provide that capability for you. Um, we at Herjavec Group are working with a great company called Farut. I don't intend this to be an advertisement or commercial or an endorsement. But uh, I am just so happy that we're finally going to have some scrutiny on this. However, I'm a di bit disappointed that it's saying you have till 2025 to look into this and, and resolve this. So my advice to everyone who's concerned about this kind of stuff, start looking at it now and start doing that inventory and start eliminating malicious scripts, unnecessary scripts, not just from payment pages, for, but from payment redirection pages. So I'm excited to see this finally. But there's a lot of a uh, lot of ground to cover, and uh, there's going to be a lot of questions around this, especially around you know the testing methodologies and technologies that are available to to be actually do this stuff. Yeah, so, 2025 that, is not really that that far away, uh, you know, in the IT world. I mean, right. all these new requirements, even you know, multi-factor authentication, you know, putting that into play in a uh, in a large enterprise is a uh, you know it's a one-year project at least. So even though um, you know, there's dates 2023, 2024, 2025 in version 4.0, um, you know, that, you know, that creeps up, you know, very, very quickly. And it's going to be, you know, here before you know it. So well, the there's, been some, now. Uh, there's been some ma major well-known breaches yeah. that have occurred because of client-side web browser vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, British Airways, I think it's Ticketmaster, somebody yeah. cracked into their e-commerce site and essentially replace their uh, redirect scripts with malicious scripts that, you know, forwarded what a client and a customer would think is a legitimate site. It's branded just like the real thing. And then they just essentially ask you to put in your, 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 your PII, including your, your cardholder data, and they harvest that. And unfortunately, if you don't have proper change control and, and file integrity monitoring, uh, just like with some of these other notable breaches, um, it took months for them to figure out what was going on. I think as a matter of fact, they weren't even aware of it until the card brands notified them and said, hey, well, this is what we're seeing, what's going on? So this is this is one of my, I've been evangelizing this for a long time and, and I'm very happy to see the council finally, you know, step up to the table and, the, and, and, and you know, it, it's time for this stuff to, to, be, to be cleaned up once and for all. Absolutely, absolutely, and and I think another another point that I wanted to make um, the fact that I see risk all through it. Um, one of the the kind of the funniest things that used to happen with me when I worked at the PCI SSC, I've always thought of PCI as 
uh, something that is risk-based. And I was told, quite frankly, straight out by many people there, oh, no, this is not a risk-based standard uh but yet we came what? out with the prioritize right but yet we came out with the prioritized approach which had six <laughs> layers of risk we're, we're six tiers of addressing risk um so i i don't know if it was just you know splitting hairs and words and what have you but uh, certainly um if you look at the prevalent environment now with the breaches and things that happen um people are finding that risk assessments uh should be done correctly. And I think for too many years, uh, I've always thought risk was important. And I've always uh, been one that wants to see risk done correctly. Uh, so I personally wanted to say, I'm really proud of all that risk stuff, I'm going to say, that's a technical term, stuff, mm -hmm. because I think it's very important that risk and managing risk be a part of daily and constant business processes within any environment where you're dealing with sensitive data like card data. It's called business as usual, right? That's right. Executive Absolutely. Summary. Absolutely. Just like the council has told us, BAU, business as usual. And it really needs to be that way. And I see too many people um, with the current version, you know, they get down to requirement 12 where the risk stuff comes up and they're like, oh, here's our risk assessment. We paid uh, one of the big four to come in and do it. And they hand me as a QSA this big giant thing. And I look at it and I go, well, this is a very nice document. Did anyone here read it? <laughs> and, and sometimes I go in and I find things and I go, did you guys realize that, you know, whoever did this ABC company pointed this out and then they're always you know they look at me like i have eight heads it's like they just thought giving me the risk assessment you know check that off yeah. well you just need it and it's like well i need to know you did something <laughs> with it, you know so i'm hoping that this you know this will be more encouraging and it will become truly business as usual and not uh you know just a, a point every year where they throw it at you well i mean uh, there's a there's a risk of companies not taking action on their risk assessment. That's right. <laughs> I mean, you know, in some ways, um, it's even worse because, you know, if, when there is a breach, you know, the attorneys are going to say, hey, you know, you knew about this, you know, six months, eight months, two years ago. I mean, obviously not doing a risk assessment is even worse, but it's, um, you know, when the doctor tells you what to do, you know, you got to listen to them. And uh, these are not trivial endeavors. And, uh, um, you know, the, the, it, once the lawyers get involved, it gets expensive extraordinarily quickly. And even uh, you know, at the end of the day, you have nothing to show for it. Um, well, I think it's reminds me companies of, that have been uh, breached. This reminds me of uh, yeah. I you you spend a hundred thousand dollar on legal fees, only get to back you know back to square one. So better take the money in advance, invest it, and um, well, I think um, we all you know, as Jeff was saying earlier, you know, this targeted risk analysis is really forcing companies, you know, understand your infrastructure. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't write like a quick CCW and give it to the QSA. This really is upping the ante, which uh, will be more expensive, which will be more time consuming. But in the long run, uh, it lessens the risk and it, you know, adds a lot more to the payment security space. So I, I think we've all had clients who essentially approach this the way uh, my son did when uh, his homework back in the day when he was in school, it's like, gee, dad, do I really have to do all this stuff? And it's like, yeah, yeah, you do. I mean, a lot of our clients approach this stuff is, is like, oh, I just, I just want to get to the check box. You know, I want all the boxes checked. I just need, and, and they don't do the risk assessments. They don't do the business as usual. You know, there are daily, weekly, biweekly, monthly, quarterly, biannual, annual tasks that have to be completed with respect to this and pretty much you know, in some instances, other frameworks as well. This is a process. It's an ongoing process. And for every one of those tasks, you have to have a corresponding artifact that validates you've actually done all that stuff. So yes, son, you got to yeah. do your homework. Fortunately, he's doing really well now. So I mean, he, he, I now, he now has three sons are giving him the business on this kind of stuff too. So goes around, comes around. That's right. Yeah, I think there's a lot of complication to it just because of the fact that it's new and it goes along with the human you know change and i always say embrace it uh, as old as i am change is good um, and i think 
um, you know, the fear that I have is I deal with a lot of, I deal with a lot of large clients, but I also deal with some smaller ones. And I think some of the mom and pops uh, are going to have a hard time. And I think um, that we as a community, um, you know, the dream team and all the other QSAs as a community and the ISAs, uh, we're going to have to be um, helpful to those uh, mom and pops in that we're going to have to make sure they really understand where they stand, what they have to do, um, and, and give them a lot of information to guide them as to how they can remediate whatever existing issues they have and sort of get through. Uh, it's one of the reasons I've stayed in this as long as I have. Uh, I've had numerous opportunities all for these years to just cut and run, and I still enjoy this. And the reason I do mm -hmm. is because it's nice to help these folks uh, through these muddy waters. And here we are again. This is like a big ford in the river. <laughs> we have the new version, so we're going to have to help. We're going to have to all get together and help them, especially the mom and pops. <laughs> well, and, and, and until we see the revised SAQs, I mean, God only knows what they're going to look like. I mean, I heard a rumor that SAQA may go the way of the dodo. Um, is that true? God, one can only hope, because um, I think we're all in agreement on, on the panel that SAQA is the most inane SAQ of the lot. I mean, but we all know why it's there. Right. We do um, know why it's there. And we're not going to do that history lesson because we'll get in trouble. But but yeah, but I agree yeah. with you. Um, th but here's the thing. Here's the thing that that I'm very hopeful for. Um, do you remember? And I think we I hope we can talk about this now because it's out and official. But do you remember when they were going through various iterations for our feedback and those initial uh, sort of sample SAQs and they called them something else, too? They yeah. Were, I forget what they were called. Because those are supposedly coming. They're, yes. They're th somewhere down the road. Those will show up, and they're but they're just going to do the SAQs for now. Yeah, and that, and and that's why you know I I I remember something I saw when I was being asked to review scared the living heck out of me <laughs> and, and i think it was whatever that was going to be and and so well, i was were, so glad to hear well we're not doing that now <laughs> well they they were actually asking people to write responses it was no longer yes and no as i recall right, right. i think and, you're right there was going to be oh, some narrative. Man. can you imagine <laughs> i know i know it well, oh. the thing that's the thing that's so sad to me is like if you take a typical um, let's take like you have a bed and breakfast or something and, um, and they're running a point of sale. And so they're, they're sort of a SAC C eligible if they've, you know, they've sort of followed those rules and this, you know, so they're on the internet, but they're not connected to a bunch of other stuff. They're not storing card data, you know, and so they fit all that criteria. One of the things I liked about the current SACs is there's those questions at the beginning that say, right. if you're doing all this stuff, then you can use this SAC. Um, can you imagine now when all of our SAC C people, well, and we don't know this, so I'm not scaring anybody. If we have to have narrative other than the check boxes, um, I shudder to think uh, what will happen to the mom and pops. And that's why I'm very concerned about the SACs. And well, they, not they won't, and I hope they won't fill them out, Coop. You know mm -hmm. that. I know they won't. I know. I it, know. You know, because, and Jason actually in the chat put it up. Merchant assessment forms, MAFs. That's what they were, MAFs, yes. And yeah. I know, thank you, uh, Jason, yes. And when I saw those, I, I mean, there was just something in them that caught my eye, and it was like, oh, gosh, no, we're not yeah. doing. Um, so, and, and, you know, and again, I, I'm, I mean, I don't see them now. They're not out, so we're just. Remember, these are our opinions, folks. We're speculating now because we don't have any new sacks in front of us. Um, but really and truly, that is something that I am concerned about because, um, uh, you know, at Trusted Sec, we'll help anybody with their, with their PCI work. So if they come to us and they're a very small uh, company, we'll help them. And, um, you know, and the thing of it is, um, that's going to be tough because for some of these companies, like we work with nonprofits and different organizations where they just don't have the money 
uh, for a lot of that. So I am very concerned. I'm, I'm just going to say me, Coop, is concerned about the sacks. Now, yeah, I, mean, I, think also, you know, I the, want to be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the mom and pop companies are squeezed. You know, they, they don't have the budget. They don't have the staff. And now 4.0 comes out and they've got a lot more. You know, this might be a, this is a good time for even the mom and pops, even, you know, the Fortune 50, the Fortune 500 to really start thinking about re-architecting, re-architecting, you know, how they handle cardholder data, you know, and, you know, ask that fundamental question, you know, why are you storing cardholder data? Because if there is no compelling reason, you know, That's don't right. store it. And well, by not but, storing it, you, you can you know, in the long term cut, you know, cut your costs significantly. That's right. To be fair, Ben, I remember going down to a small municipal airport years ago and some FDP, what were those? FDP 150s or whatever, the oh, first boy. data card terminals. I remember those. Oh, my Lord, those were scary. <laughs> oh, and they had four of them. One is out in a box so that private pilots can buy av gas for their planes and it's sitting out in a weatherproof box but the thing that irritated me the most was fdr had not uh configured the damn things right so they were storing all the credit card transactions that had been run since practically because i mean this is an airport so, you know, how many how many pilots hit the one outside after hours? It it's not it's not all the time, but it's rare. And there the they had credit card numbers going back 2 years. And the ones inside had the last 3 months cuz they were used more often for not only avgas but parts because it was a repair operation and this that and the other thing but the thing that concerned me the most about it was these were cards with high value credit limits on them because this is plane repair this isn't a car so the average the average transaction going through was in the thousands of dollars so if you knew that it was storing those cards, my God, you could have made out like a bandit. Mm -hmm. And I remember calling FDR and saying, what did you do? Oh, well, that's up to the merchant to fix. Oh, really? When were you going to tell them this? Well, I think it's in the manual. I said, no, it's not. It's not in the manual. But I said, I'm going to do it, but I don't want to do it unless you tell me not to oh no it should be set up that way Oy. yeah so where are we we got we got seven minutes i think we covered all the uh we get yeah all the questions oh, somebody an anonymous attendee brought up desv oh man <laughs> The, the 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 PCI assessment from hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a double secret probation assessment. I call it. <laughs> um, I've I've had to do a few of those, and and I, uh, I I always sort of understood. And in every case, I had to do them. They were clients that um, had come to us because they had been breached, and the brands had told them you need to do. Uh, you're now a DESV, or the acquirer had told them that, and. Um, it was a lot of work, so that's a good question, and I don't know that we're aware of any DESV slash 4.0 stuff yet. I know I haven't seen it. Have you uh, gentlemen seen that? Because I have nope. not. I mean, the DESV, the um, Designated Entity Supplemental Validation, I mean, I, yeah. I think they're a few months away from, uh, you know, getting that on the uh, council website. Yeah, and the thing of it is, you know, the DESV came out after uh, PCI had been around a while and because, uh, you know, I, my assumption, this is an assumption, but my assumption is that the brands and the acquirers were probably saying, you know, these people have been breached. Uh, we don't just want another rock from them next year. We want to guarantee that they've stepped up their game. And so that was what the DESV was all about. And so I'm, I'm wondering if with 4.0, 
uh, we may run with it a while before they come out with the double secret probation version of the DESV uh, for four O. But I could be wrong. It's just, just again, assumptions that I have. Well, so um, once again, this is like our first take, our, our first pass, if you will, on four O. We'll probably have some follow ups on this. Yeah. I know I, I'm on the hook to do a blog for Herjavec on this stuff. But um, at, at, at the highest level, my first uh, in, um, sort of inclination regarding 4.0 was there was some really good stuff that has been improved. I think you guys can all remember that, you know, when 3.0 came out, uh, the section that precedes the table with all the requirements, um, there were scoping considerations and things that were sort of implied, if you will. Fortunately, since then they've clarified stuff through three, two, one, and one of the one of the things I was most happy to see in this new version uh, from the council is they really put a lot of effort, time, and thought in that section that precedes the table that you know clarifies the requirements and really goes into detail about what you know what you're expected to do and and um, you know, I think they went to great pains to try to make the, that part of the, the, the of the of the requirement or the, or the framework more clear than I've ever ever seen them do. So I, I was very happy to see that because that, I think that's going to help all of us. But you know, QSAs, uh, uh, merchants, and service providers. I mean, even you know, they're you know, whatever you write. You know, I mean, even you know, short of, you know, assembler code, you know, there is ambiguity. And as, as prescriptive as the writers try to make it, you know, not everything is black and white. A lot of these things are gray. There's, there's things that uh, you know, are vague and, you know, there is some interpretation there. But at the end of the day, you know, whether you're PCI compliant or not, you know, companies need to, you know, put those, you know, good security controls in place. You can't just, you know, point fingers at this monster called, uh, you know, version four. But uh, yeah, I said it's uh, it's been out a few weeks and it's a learning experience for everyone. And, you know, um, there is this transition period. And once again, no one could do anything until, uh, you know, the training starts in June. Um, and it's going to take a, a chunk of time to get all the QSAs trained. And it's going to take a chunk of time to, to educate the merchants and service provider community yeah. as well. So, yeah, Good job security for QSAs. Care. Well, um, yeah, I, you know, I've heard that said. I, I think the biggest problem that I see um, is not so much the complications or the changes, but the shifting of paradigms. I'm very concerned about that. And what I mean is paradigms that the merchants and service providers have and paradigms that we as QSAs have. And we're going to have to shift those paradigms, the, the old way that we've been kind of doing things. Um, is going to change. And as I had said earlier, you know, I, I think change is good. And I hope um, that, you know, the QSA community uh, and the ISA community will continue to educate uh, because it's very, very important. One of the things that I really hate is when I hear an ISA or a QSA act like they can't explain something to somebody because it's some type of job security that just makes me nuts. And so that would be my call to everyone on this um, uh, webinar and anyone out there that views this later on. If you're involved in this community, educate folks. If you know something, share it. I think that's really important. Okay, you know, we're, uh, we're coming up, uh, you know, on the hour now. So um, yeah, I said is, you know, we've got to do this again. And I again in a few months and uh, say, you know, after, you know, three, four months of real world, you know, version four experience, but, um, you know, thank you everyone. Uh, you know, thank you, Jeff, Coop, Dave, you know, thanks for, uh, you know, your great insights today. I'm looking forward to have uh, our participants join us on uh, our next webinar, you know, stay tuned to the trusted sec website. Uh, you know, Jeff, uh, tweets about it. I tweet about it. So uh, stay on top. And once again, if you have any questions, insights uh, for us, please send it to the, uh, the PCI Dream Team at Gmail, and we will uh, do our best to, uh, to get back to you. Um, once again, this is a, you know, we don't know it all. No one knows it all. This is a, uh, a community effort. So, uh, you know, thanks for joining us uh, on this journey.
So uh, once again, thank you everyone uh, for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Trusted Tech as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks, Trusted folks. Tech. <laughs>